All right. Well, we've got a good book. You probably didn't know that. I think it hurts, you know that? I won't say what I was thinking. Genesis chapter 30. we got a good book. And the thing I like about this book is that God wrote it. You know the neat thing about God is you can't get away from him? Now, you've got to admit, that's pretty good. Um, so we're not going to use this. Let me get it out of my way. Yeah, let me get it out of my way. you got a grown-up taking this thing up there. Anyway, uh, you know, our country would like to say that they, 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 uh, they kick him out of their school so they don't have to worry about God. And that was all well and good till he left the uh, farmlands and the, uh, everything else without rain. He left the whole place and we got trouble. You know, it's neat that God will not let you ignore him. Uh, they got uh, somebody set up in Cleveland, Ohio. They paid some Indian about three grand to dance around and try to get some rain. And they'll probably get some psychic to try to get some rain. They'll probably try to seed the clouds to get some rain. But the fact of the matter is, if this thing goes on another couple of months, uh, some people are going to be talking to God, okay? Uh, I said that, uh, you remember when the uh, space shuttle blew up? And then right after that, they uh, tried to fire a uh, Titan D out at Vandenberg, and that blew up. And then the French tried to fire one over there in France, and it blew up. So they pulled out the Chevy which was the Delta rocket down in Cape Canaveral. They've, had, they've shot them off for 25 years without a miss. Put it out there, launch pad, set it up in there, and they said at 71 seconds, here's the exact quote from NASA, it blew up as if on command. Well, I knew who was giving command. And I made the statement, I said, I'm going to guarantee you some of those dudes in the white jackets and the white coats are going to be before the next launch, sneaking off saying, excuse me, fellas, I've got to go down the hall, you know, and they're going to step into a room somewhere and say, now, God, please, please, God, this thing's got to get out. It's, it's got to get out. And um, the fact is that God is going to make it so that you can't ignore him, all right? Now, here's the fact. God wrote this book, and God made you. And the neat part about it is that you are going to quote this book from now until you go home being with, with him in glory. There's no way that you're ever going to get away from quoting this Bible. And I like that because uh, you've got a group of people around our country that, you know, you got the Carl Sagans who think that everybody came from a mud puddle and everything else, and... and um, with all that going on, uh, you've got a bunch of people who would like to tell you that we didn't come from God, yet you know what they'll do? They'll quote the Bible the rest of their life. And I'm going I'm to prophesy for you a little bit. I'm going to tell you this. If you go home today, take your Bible and throw it away. Take your Bible and put it on a shelf. Lock it up. Don't ever read it again. If you go home and never say, I will never quote John 3.16 again, or I'll never quote the Bible again, I'm going to tell you now, you're going to quote this book the rest of your life. Lost people quote this book. Lost scientists quote this book. People that hate God quote this book. Atheists quote this book. Why? Because the same God made us made this book. And you are not going to get away from the fact that there is, a, there is an integral part. There is something about that book and us that, that our designer has linked us permanently. You don't need a King James Bible to quote a King James Bible. Do you know that? That is a fact. I say again, you don't need a King James Bible to quote a King James Bible. You don't have to believe in, a, in the King James Bible. You don't have to believe in God. You don't have to believe in anything else. And you're still going to quote a King James Bible. So uh, beginning in Genesis chapter 30, and what I'm going to give you is I'm going to give you uh, two groups. One is going to be some Bible quotes that uh, the Bible had before mankind ever used them. And they have found their way into our everyday speech. And then the second one is Bible facts, facts that the Bible had before science discovered them. I like that. Uh, science likes to take credit for a lot of stuff. And uh, if they had just read their Bible, they'd have known it about three or 4,000 years ahead of time. But leave it to science to drag along behind. Uh, in um, Genesis chapter 30, Laban makes this statement in verse 27. And Laban said unto him, I pray thee, if I have found favor in thine eyes, carry, for I have learned by experience that the Lord hath blessed me for thy sake. And that, that phrase, learned by experience. Haven't you done that? Uh, you know, you look at the... Remember when you got out of high school how much you knew? You knew everything. As you got older, you got dumber. And um, remember how much you thought you knew, and yet what happened? You learned by experience. Isn't that what we say? You say, I'll give you the job, but you have to learn by experience. Uh, some of you men, you finally married somebody that said yes, but you'd asked about eight of them before that. And uh, what you did is you learned by experience, I guess maybe asked four or five at one time so that, you know, when the uh, results come in, you've got one. But the fact is that over life, as life goes on, you will learn things by experience. Look at Genesis chapter 31. 
Genesis chapter 31. When I lived at home, my brother and I had a room, and we had two twin beds, and um, when, he, when my sister got married, he moved into her room, so I had a room with two twin beds. Now, no matter how greedy you are, you can't use two twin beds at one time. So one of those beds I slept in, and the other one became kind of a horizontal closet. You know, everything that came out of my pockets went onto that bed, and, and literally the whole top of the bed was covered. And, but I knew everything was, you know, it was like down layer four, back by the wall, under the pillow, you know, I knew everything was. And um, sometimes when I, was, when I was away, there would be a disaster sweep through our house. My mother would clean that place up. And, you know, mothers have a way of dropping a letter. It could be an eight-page letter. It drops to the floor, falls open, and she can read every word by the time she stands up and put it back in. And uh, when that kind of thing happened, when I came in and I found out that that bed had been cleaned up or my closet had been put in order, uh, I usually reacted something like, uh, like um, Jacob did to Laban in Genesis chapter 31, verse 37. And I said, whereas thou hast searched all my stuff. <laughs> and isn't that the truth? I mean, isn't that what you call it? You say, I, you, searched my, you searched all my stuff. And when you, uh, when you go to move, what do you call it? You say, we, got, we put our stuff on the truck. Some of you guys came down here, you say, go take my stuff down to the cabin. Or get our stuff and put it up in the motel room. That is what you call it. You know, I, got a, I looked at a New King James, a New American Standard, and NIV on this. And the New King James says, Thou searched, or, you searched all my things. And the NASV and the NIV say, you searched all my goods. Well, that's all well and good, but I'm going to tell you something, people. Is that how we talk? No. You know, they talk about a modern translation ought to use words that we use today. Everybody here says stuff. Isn't that the truth? Amen. You don't say all my goods. You say, that, uh, is that your stuff over there? <laughs> right? Amen. I'll tell you something else. If you're here today and you were an atheist and you didn't believe the King James Bible was word of God, you didn't think that there was a God, you thought the world was flat, you thought that, you know, it didn't matter what you think, you know that you're still going to say, I don't believe any of that stuff. Or you're going to say, well, I'm going to get my stuff and get out of here. You, you religious fanatics are going crazy. I'm going to tell you something, people. People are going to quote that King James Bible. I don't care if you don't say Jesus wept. I don't care if you don't quote John 3.16. You're going to say something that the King James Bible said centuries before you were born. Look at um, Genesis 37. Before his brothers sold him, David, uh, Joseph's brothers took him, and they lowered him into a pit. It says this, verse 24, and they took him and cast him into a pit. So when you're really down, what do you say? You say, I'm in the pit. Now, you know somewhere, I wouldn't doubt that about the third time one of those uh, rocket ships blew up, you know, one of those guys trying to get it off there in Cape Canaveral, I mean, space shuttle blew up, you know, and that Titan blew up, and that Delta blew up. I'll bet there's a whole bunch of scientists say, how are you? They say, man, I'm in the pit. They didn't know they were quoting God's book. You say, well, you think they read a King James Bible sometime that's how it got in? Nope. Oh, that's not what I believe at all. You know what I believe? I believe the same God that wrote this book made them. That's what I believe. I believe God left his handiwork inside them. And I'm going to tell you, people, you, the only way you're going to stop from quoting that book is to blow your brains out. You are going to quote that book from now till the Lord comes back because the God that made this book made your brain and you are going to use the same phraseology that he put in his authorized Bible. So when you get down, you're going to say, I'm in the pit, whether you like it or not. Look at uh, Exodus chapter 36. We have mathematical terminology in Exodus chapter 36. Verse 22 says, one board had two tenons equally distant one from another. So when I had new math, we called that equidistant. How many of you ever heard that term, equidistant? Now you thought you got that from math class, didn't you? You know where that came from? That came from Exodus 36 of a King James Bible. You know what they called it? New math. Now ain't that deceiving? I had it in the seventh grade. They called it new math. And the terminology that they used, they got out of a Bible that was 300 years old. Now that's a wild thing, isn't it? You think those mathematicians, when they got down and figured up the term equidistant, you think they looked at a King James Bible to get it? Not in your life. But they got it from there, didn't they? Look down to verse uh, 33 and you'll see something else. It says, He made the middle bar to shoot through the boards from the one end to the other. So when you want a, you want a straight line, how, what do they say? They say, you shoot it. If you throw a stone, they say, what do they say? They say, you shot a stone. 
Or if you want a straight line, you set up a transit, and what do you do? You shoot a line, do you not? You shoot something because that is straight. And he was talking about how they had the boards for the tabernacle, and they had a hole through there, and you shot a bar right through the center of those. That thing was shot right down through the center. There wasn't no guns, there wasn't no cannons, but that thing was shot through there. And so when we want a, when we want a straight line, you, you call a whole crew out here, and you get yourself a surveyor, and you know what he does? He goes out there with his transom and everything else, and he quotes a King James Bible because he shoots a straight line. Can't get away from it. Look at um, Deuteronomy chapter 29. Twenty-nine, verse twenty, talks about when somebody's angry. Here's what happens: the Lord will not spare him, but then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smoke against that man. So when you say somebody was mad, you say, "Boy, they were smoking." Did you ever see the cartoons? Yeah. What do they What do they do when somebody's mad? Don't they make smoke come off the guy? Now, did you know that they were quoting the King James Bible when they did that? Do you know that an animator, a guy that draws cartoons? has to make somebody mad, and the only way he can make it look like they were mad was to follow what a Bible that was 400 years old told him to do. He had to write down somebody who was smoking when they were mad. You know, the, the heat coming off, you know? You know why? Because the Bible said when God got mad, he smoked. Now, I don't believe that God pulled out of Winston or Chesterfield, you know, that's not what I mean at all. What I mean is that it says that God was so mad, he was smoking. He was simmering. Isn't that what you say? Don't you say, boy, I got hot. Well, you got hot and you smoke when you get mad. That's, you can't get away from it. Look at um, 2 Chronicles chapter 36. Second Chronicles chapter 36. And verse 3, and this is where the king of Egypt defeated the king of Judah, and it says, And the king of Egypt put him down at Jerusalem. So when you have been defeated, or when something not, does not go your way, or when somebody really puts it on you, what do you say? You say, boy, what a put down. Have you ever been put down in your life? Have you ever had anybody put you down? Or did you ever feel like you've been put down? Well, if you said, boy, they, they really, we really put them down. You know what you just did? You just quoted a King James Bible. Those other versions I was telling you about, the New King James says deposed him. The New American Standard says deposed him. The New International says dethroned him. Now, all three of those are true. But that's not what we use, is it? How many times you say, boy, they really deposed them? <laughs> is that what you say? All right, they really dethroned him. No, you know what they say? say boy, did they ever, boy, did, what a put down. Man, that guy got ready and he thought everything was going to go his way. Uh, I'll give you a good example. You know, when... when uh, uh, Haman walked in to see the king, Ahasuerus, you know, and the king says, uh, who do you want, you know, what should the king do to a man that he delights in? And he said, oh man, he's got to be talking about me. He says, I'd get his, you know, I'd put his robe on, put his crown on, have the greatest man in the kingdom, uh, lead him on the king's own horse. And so he said, okay, you go do that to Mordecai. Boy, what a put down for Haman. But you don't say he deposed, or oh, what a depose. <laughs> You're going to quote this book. That book's the most modern book there is. Did you know that? You talk about archaic words. That's got, listen, I believe this book has got, already got some cliches that we don't even use yet. That's what I believe. You think they'll walk around saying, what a put down in 1611? I doubt it. But we, get, we grabbed it from that book. Look at um, Nehemiah chapter 13. In Nehemiah chapter 13, Nehemiah is going to yell at some fellas. And in doing that, he says this, verse 11, Then contended I with the rulers, and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together, and set them in their place. So what do we say? When somebody has really been uh, had it put on, we say, Boy, he put him in his place. Don't you, isn't there somewhere where you work you'd like to see him put in their place? Isn't that true? Don't you say, boy, they, they really put him in his place, or she really got put in her place. 
Well, that's what Nehemiah. Nehemiah did it first. Nehemiah did it first. <laughs> you know, kids are well. I did it first. Well, Nehemiah did it first, folks. Nehemiah said, "I set them in their place." And when he said that, he said something that we would be quoting from now until the Lord comes back, and not be able to get away from it. Look at Job, chapter nineteen. Job chapter 19, Job makes a narrow escape. You ever make a narrow escape? You ever just get by? You might have quoted Job when you did. I know many people have. In fact, I, uh, I've got some papers here I've got to quote. In Job chapter 19, verse 20, he says, My bone cleaveth to my skin and to my flesh, and I am escaped with the skin of my teeth. So when you just get by, what do you say? You say, I got by by the skin of my teeth. I've got, a, I've got a, something else here if I can find it. Um, okay. So when you, uh, when you narrowly escape, you say, we got by by the skin of our teeth. If you just barely win the game, you say, I got by by the skin of my teeth. I've got uh, a quote here where Time Magazine in February of this year was quoting a King James Bible. I'll give it to you in just a second. In fact, open your Bibles to um, Psalm 107. And in Psalm 107, it talks about somebody that doesn't know just what to do next. And it makes this statement in verse 27, says, They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. Now I ask you, is that archaic? Is that phrase archaic? It says, they are at their wit's end. You ever been at your wit's end? This is uh, Time Magazine, February 22nd, 1988. Now you know Time, that Christian publication. And uh, it's, it's talking about the uh, Soviets being in Afghanistan. And it says, the war, meanwhile, is going disaster, disastrously for the Soviets, says Alex Alexiev, a senior analyst at the RAND Corporation. You know that Christian organization, the RAND Corporation. It says, quote, they are at their wit's end. Now, you think that fellow opened up his King James Bible to get that quote? Do you think that Bible, do you think that fellow even knows it exists? You think this guy knows that he quoted Psalm 107 when he said that? Not on your life. You know why? That, that guy may be an atheist. I mean, Time is not a Christian publication. The Rand Corporation is not a Christian organization. And yet there it is, right in the middle of February 1988. There they are quoting your King James Bible. Somebody should have told him it was archaic. Look at um, Psalm 137. In verse 3, and it talks about having been destroyed, and it says this, For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song, and they that wasted us required of us mirth. So when you really lose big, you say, man, they wasted us. Do you ever say that? Well, they wasted those guys. Well, we wasted them, man. That doesn't sound archaic, does it? That doesn't sound like talk that is almost 400 years old, does it? That sounds like something you hear down the ballpark. I mean... You wouldn't want to quote everything you heard out the ballpark, but that sounds like something you heard out the ballpark, doesn't it? You say, man, they wasted those guys. That is exactly what Israel said about what their enemies had done to them. Of course, the only reason Israel said that was because they said someday there's going to be an America, and someday there's going to be some people speaking English, and someday they're going to use this as a cliche. No. Nope, they had no idea, and the men that use it today had no idea. Look at Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4, I wonder if you've ever heard this one, verse 25, let thine eyes look right on, 
Remember ever said, everybody said that? Right on! Remember when that was going around? You think somebody got that out of King James Bible? They sure did. You think they knew it? Sure didn't. I like what the New Bible say. Uh, the King James Bible says, right on. The New King James Version says, your eyelids look right before you. How do your eyelids look anything? You don't look at... The New American Standard Version says, let your gaze be fixed straight. The New, New, New International says, fix your gaze directly. Well, I can just hear them walking down the street saying, gaze directly. <laughs> right? Fix your gaze straight. <laughs> no, you know what they say? say right on. <laughs> they don't know they're quoting the King James Bible, but I'll tell you what they do know. They know better than to quote anything else. Ain't that amazing? Isn't that amazing that when people that, that reject the Bible quote the Bible, they quote the one that everybody else rejects? At least they know which one to quote when they quote one, don't they? I mean, if you're going to quote one and not know it, you may as well quote the right one. But you see, when you quote it, you're only going to quote one because God only wrote one. And now I ask you, which one is which one's easier? You know what you'll notice whenever you read a King James Bible and you read what these other guys say? You'll find out that what the King James Bible says in a word, they needed a whole phrase to say. He said, let thine eyes look right on. And they had to say, let your eyelids look right before you. Let your gaze be fixed straight. And all the King James Bible said was, right on. Which one's right on? Look at um, Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. I used to hate this one. I did. I didn't even know it was in the Bible, but I hated it. Before I got saved, I hated it. Look what it says in verse 20. It says, Curse not the king, no, not in thy thought, and curse not the rich in thy bedchamber. For a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. What do we get from that? A little bird told me. Man, I'll tell you, before I got saved, I hated them birds. I, didn't, you ever go, didn't you ever give your parents one story and then go and do something else? and get back and find out that they somehow found out, and you ask them, I mean, here you are, you're 17 years old, and, and you say, how did you find out? And they say, a little bird told me. Well, I get my hand, I still don't like birds. Do you know that? I wouldn't have one in my house. And you know what? That thing comes from a King James Bible. A little bird told me. My mother, now, my mother didn't know she was quoting a King James Bible when she told me that. And I didn't know she was quoting a King James Bible when she told me that. And if we had never seen a King James Bible today in our life, we would have gone on quoting it from now till God come back. Why? Same God wrote that book made me. Same God wrote that book made you. You can't divorce yourself from that Bible. Look at, um, oh, look at, I'm sorry, look at one, uh, back to Proverbs chapter 7. Proverbs chapter 7, when you really like something or when somebody, you know, like, um, oh, you know how a granddaughter is with a grandfather, you know, that kind of thing, special. They say something like uh, you find in verse 2, keep my commandments and live and my law as the apple of thine eye. And so they say, oh, she just the apple of her granddaddy's eye. And know what they say? Oh, that's just the apple of their eye. That's just the apple of our eye. People, that's out of the King James Bible. Now, the fact is this. You could go down to, um, oh, I don't care. You go, you know, go down to the ballpark and then, you know, uh, go to the science lab and go someplace else and take a bunch of cliches and try to print your new Bible and put them in. That isn't what happened here, is it? God put them in and we took them out and used them. We used them after God had them already in here. So when you see something and it catches your attention, you say, it's the apple of my eye, you're quoting a King James Bible. Look at Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. In Isaiah chapter 40, look at, um, when you kind of look at your check, 
as opposed to your bills, you know, your income as opposed to your outgo. Uh, you might say, or, or if uh, we had about three drops of rain, when we were on our way up here, I, I did tell you, we did hit rain. And I, this is not exaggerating, there were about 20 drops on our windshield. I mean, I didn't even have to use the, win the windshield wipers. That's how little came down, just not near enough. If it rained for an hour right now, it wouldn't be enough. And we would say something like what we see in verse 15. It says, Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket. And we say, drop in a bucket. So you look at your check as opposed to your bills, and you say, boy, that's a drop in a bucket. When you don't get enough, what do you say? You say, that's like a... You ever seen a drop in a bucket? I mean, just a little old number two bucket, a two-gallon bucket. Did you ever see a drop in that bucket? It makes that drop look so small. And if you've got a number uh, a five uh, or, or number ten tub, you put a drop in there, man, that's nothing. Well, God says, it's, the nations are as a drop of a bucket. And people... We're going to quote that. We're not going to get away from it. It's God's book. We are God's, we are God's creatures, all right? We are not all God's children, but we are all God's creatures. We are his creation. He made us, and he left his fingerprints all over us. You know how? You know how I know that? Because when I opened up this book, I found his fingerprints all over it, like drop of a bucket. Look at um, chapter 52, Isaiah 52. You've used this one. Verse 8, Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice. With the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye. Haven't you ever said, we just don't see eye to eye? How many of you heard that term, they don't see eye to eye? Let's see your hand. See that? That's everybody here. Now, did you know the first time you heard that? Did you know that you heard it? You were hearing a King James Bible being quoted? No. You know, you say, boy, you know, my, me and my boss, we just don't see eye to eye. Or me and my mother-in-law, we just don't see... Of course, nobody can see eye to eye. Little, but anyway, uh, we just don't see eye to eye. You say that. And people say that. You know, you might talk to somebody, some atheist, you know, and they might say, after you try to give them the gospel or everything else, they might say, say you know what our problem is? You say, what? Say, our problem is we just don't see eye to eye on this. So, well, thank you. At least you believe the book. <laughs> They're going to quote the King James Bible. And if they don't see eye to eye with us on that, that's all right. They're going to quote it anyway. Look at uh, chapter 65. Chapter 65. You've met somebody like this, I imagine. Look at verse 5 would say, Stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. And that, you know, don't you know anybody with that holier than thou attitude? Haven't you ever, you know, with just a touch of venom, described somebody in that holier than thou attitude? Isn't that, isn't that what you've said? Well, you're quoting a book. You didn't, you didn't say, I'm going to say something bad about them. Uh, let me just check the Bible if I can find something. Maybe I'll just look in Isaiah 65. No. You didn't even know it was in Scripture when you quoted it. And you know, that's what they say about us. You know, they talk about us Christians. You know, we all say, well, you guys are all holier than thou. Isn't that what they call you? you say, well, thank you. I'm glad at least you used my Bible. Well, what do you mean? Just, just, just want to show you where you got your words from. You know what you can tell them? You can tell them this. You know what your problem is, buddy? You can't get away from quoting this book. You're going to quote it the rest of your life. I will not. I'll never read it. I'll never quote it. I won't even put any of its words in my mind. That's okay. Your Creator put them in you before you knew it. He put them inside your head and inside your heart. And you're, he said, I don't believe any of that stuff. Keep on going. <laughs> Look at um, Ezekiel chapter 21. Ezekiel chapter 21. You have at one time or another with a girlfriend or a boyfriend or with a job or with, you know, whatever the case may be, or just with a friend, you have come to this place in your life. It's a sad place. It really is. Uh, many of you had high school friends that just aren't friends anymore. You disagreed over something. You couldn't see eye to eye or whatever, whatever the case may be. And you came... To verse 21, it says, For the king of Babylon stood at the parting of the way. 
And every one of us has stood there, have we not? Every one of us have found a time in our life when someone that we loved and someone that we cared about and someone that we had agreed with and someone that we'd gotten along with and someone who had been special to us, one day, uh, whatever the case may be and whatever uh, uh, caused it, one day we no longer could agree with them. And you know what we did? We came to the parting of the way. And that's where the way splits this way and one goes one way. Well, you take the high road, I'll take the low road, write a song about it, don't they? But it comes out of the King James Bible. You talk to somebody where you work, you talk to somebody in your family, and they say, look, we can talk about this, and we can talk about that, but when you can talk about that Bible, we come to the parting of the way. That's right. King James Bible, they quoted. They're not going to get away from it. Look at um, Luke, chapter 9. I'm not giving you everything i got here. I've got about 60 of them. Did you ever try to explain anything to your kids? Well, there's a waste of time, isn't it? Yeah, you know, uh, we lock on, I, and my son's looking at me right now, but, but I say, look at, look at me, and I say, repeat this to me. I make him, you know, say to me what I asked him to do. He gets two steps away from me and says, what, what did you want? You know. And what I want to happen is I want to happen what happens what the Lord wants in Luke 9.44. He says, let these things sink down into your ears. <laughs> now, hasn't anybody ever said, hey man, let that thing, let that sink in, will you? Haven't you ever had, have you ever had anything sink in? Uh, we, my wife, we've got a preacher friend, and his wife, one of the funniest ladies, because every joke you tell, she gets it two hours later. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, I don't know if, if the circuits are all overloaded at the time, but like, you know, we would be talking, and two hours from now, just like you in the middle of the conversation, she'll say, <laughs> oh, she said, that was funny. I was, nobody said anything funny. No, what you said a little while ago, you know what happened? It sunk in. It finally got in. Or I've had her say, uh, uh, we've been sitting there at the dinner table, and she just, she'd look at her husband and say, why did you say that? Man, he didn't say nothing. But I mean, he just, he was even chewing with his mouth open. And he said, what are you talking about? Well, when you said, and it was like a couple, you know what? It finally sunk in. And haven't you ever tried, you know, if you try to teach, if you try to teach and you finally see the lights come on, you know what you say? You say, it finally what? It sunk in. And so when you talk to him, you know, you say, let this sink in, will you? I, I got a friend of mine, and he said, I got so tired of my daughters. He said, I knew every time I told them to do something, I was going to have to tell them twice. So he said, I just said everything twice. He said, I just said, go clean your room, go clean your room. Go do the dishes, go do the dishes. He said, they'd get so mad. He said, I, it had to get in. And so the Lord knew that, see? Jesus Christ knew that. So he said, let this sink in, will you? Hey, look, if you will let the stuff that I give you this week sink in, ain't nobody going to shake you on your book. Look at Luke chapter 15. You know there's two words put you to rest? You know that? If you're worried about somebody, or if somebody is worried about you and you want to put them to rest, you can use two words from a King James Bible and never, and, and that's all you have to say. Two words. That's it. That King James Bible condenses everything, makes it all easy to understand. And here's what you say. Down here in verse, um, well, let me find it. Luke chapter 15, verse 27. And he said to him, this is when the prodigal son came home. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he received him safe and sound. Do you ever ship anything? Do you ever have, uh, have somebody that you love uh, take a long trip, and if you heard that they got there safe and sound, you didn't need to worry about anything else, right? You didn't have to, they didn't have to go into a two-hour discourse on the bumps that the airplane had in the sky or the near miss or anything. They just said, we're safe and sound. Say, did the package get there? Safe and sound. You knew that it wasn't torn. You knew that it wasn't crushed. It was safe. Two words out of a King James Bible put everybody's mind to ease. Isn't that true? You show me another Bible, give you two, two words, put your mind at ease about anybody in the country. Listen, if you're worried about anybody in this country today, 
If you're worried about anybody in this country today, and all you hear about them is they're safe and sound, you have nothing more to worry about. Isn't that true? Out of the King James Bible. Not a bad book, is it? Uh-oh. About became a plant manager. Look at Luke chapter 22. Everybody says, don't think we're going to go metric. Nope. I think we're going to go metric as soon as we get the next president, but I don't want to go. No, you think we're going to stay English? No, I think we're going to stay Bible. I just think we're going to stay Bible. So how close is something? Oh, pretty close when it's like you find in verse 41. Luke 22, 41. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast. So when something's close, what do you say? You say it's stone's throw away, right? Now, how many atheists in this country do you think have ever quoted that verse and didn't know they were quoting that verse? Did you ever wonder about that? How many people in this world who do not believe the King James Bible is the Word of God have quoted a stone's throw away? Isn't that true? Do you think everybody's running around saying a stone's throw away when the Lord uh, went a stone's throw away? No. Nope. You think that when Luke penned that under the inspiration of God himself, you think when Luke penned that, he said, boy, I'm going to say something here. I bet they're going to be saying in, in uh, Plainville, Connecticut someday. No, nope. He never knew it. But God did. And inside, you know what you've got in you? You have got an entire King James Bible glossary of words that you use. And you have no, and I'll tell you what, that glossary is in every human being on the face of this earth. It's in everyone. You know why? Same God made you made this book. And you can't, you can't get away from the similarity. Look at, um, oh, let's look at John chapter 4. John had just, or God had, uh, Jesus Christ had just been talking to the lady at the well. And his disciples had gone to buy some meat for him. And they came back, tried to feed him. He said he wasn't hungry, which scared him, because they were Baptists probably. And they like to eat. So it says this in verse 34. Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. And so when you really like to do something, what do you say? That's my meat. That's my meat right there. I talked to a fellow one time, a preacher, and he said, Sam, he said, I can do this, and he says, I can do that, and he said, I can do this other thing. But he said, my meat is door-to-door -door work. He said, I just like to go door-to-door -door work. I just like to do That's my meat. And if you have something you like to do, you say, boy, that's my meat. I mean, I just, man, I can just sit down and do that all day long. That's your meat. You know where you say that? You know where you got that from? Authorized version. Look at um, Acts 20. Acts 20, verse 24, phrase we use, it says, But none of these things move me. So we say, that just doesn't move me. Have you ever said that? Have you ever heard anybody say that? That just, that just doesn't move me. Or that's a very moving thing, isn't it? That, that music is very moving. Where do you think they got that from? Do you think they knew they were going to be quoting God's word when they said that? Did you know you were quoting God's word when you said it? Not in your life. Not on your life. But you're going to do it. Let's look at Romans chapter 13. Romans 13, we all see this at one time or another. It's a, it's a horrible time. Verse 11. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep. But those two words, high time, haven't you ever used that? Have you ever had anybody, you know, when the husband finally says, you know what I'm going to do today? I think I'm going to fix that leaky faucet. And you say, it's about high time you did. Quoting again from Time Magazine, February 22nd, 1988. This must have been a real scriptural edition. Uh, old uh, Alex again from the Rand Corporation says this about the Soviets, about the uh, Afghanistan administration. It is high time for the administration to realize that the only way to stop the bloodshed in Afghanistan is an unconditional uh, Soviet withdrawal. Now, isn't that funny, that fellow? Do you, real, do you think that guy realized 
You think going through his mind when he wrote this, uh, going through his mind was Romans 13, verse 11? I'll bet you said to that fellow, what does Romans 13, 11 say? He'd say, what's Romans? Well, you know, Romans, the book of the Bible, 13, 11. Oh, is that uh, Jesus wept? No, that's where it says what you said in Time Magazine on February 22nd, 1988. It's high time for the Russians to get out of Afghanistan because they're at their wit's end. This guy's a real Bible scholar, do you know that? His name is Alex Alex. Man, that's the word words end and X. All right. I want you to go to Job 25. And we are going to leave the Bible quotes, and we are now going to look at some scientific facts that your Bible had long before science discovered them. Discover is a wonderful word. Whenever science discovers something that the Bible already had for centuries before them, sometimes four or five thousand years before science discovered it, science pops up with it like they just, uh, you know, they just thought it was the greatest thing. I heard recently where they discovered a whole new dinosaur. Can you believe that? I mean, if those things are real, do you, do you think that after all these years, somebody just now found one, all this digging going on, they just found, and you know how they identified it? They got its head. I remember years ago, and I thought, was, I, I thought this guy was in the wrong business, but in, years ago, in the Masson paper, it, it had an artist drawing of this dinosaur, and this was another, this was another new dinosaur, this was probably 10 years ago. And they had the drawing, listen, they had the height of it, how many spines it had on its back, how long its tail was, the size of its head. You know what they had found of that dinosaur? They had found a footprint. By finding a footprint, they knew how many spines it had on its back, how long its tail was, size of its head. This dude shouldn't be working for science, he'll be working for the police department. Imagine finding a footstep outside the window, footprint, so this guy's six foot tall, he's blonde, blue, ear, uh, blue eyes, uh, he's got a, he, he walks with a limp, uh, he's got a tattoo on his left, left arm, says, Mom. So how'd you know? Why? Well, so I found his footprint. I'll draw a picture of, you, of him for you because I found his footprint. He didn't find a footprint of a dinosaur. You know how tall, how long his tail is? How big his head is? How many teeth it's got? How, how many spines it's got in his back? From a footprint? That's science, all right. That's one half of the phrase. That's science fiction. So science goes around discovering things that the Bible has said for years. Now, the oldest book in your Bible, the oldest written book in your Bible is the book of Job. And we will find some scientific facts in your Bible that were there long before science found out about them. Look at verse 5. 25.5. Job. Behold, even to the moon, and it shineth not. Now everybody knows that the moon shines. Job said the moon didn't shine. You know what the moon doesn't do? The moon doesn't shine. The moon reflects. The sun shines. Okay? You see these lights? These lights are shining. They're sending light out. The sun sends light out. The sun shines. The moon does not shine. The moon reflects. The moon does nothing more than bounce the light that the sun shines off of it back down onto this earth. So the moon does not shine. And don't you think that whatever the scientists of his day were when they read the book of Job, don't you think they got a laugh out of that? I bet they got a laugh out of the second half of the verse, too. Yea, the stars are not pure in his sight. If you want to purify something, if you want to clear it, if you want to clean it, if you want to get the germs off of it, what do you do? Put it in fire, right? Before they operate on somebody, they put something in heat. That heat, that intense heat, that fire purges it, does it not? Even the Bible talks about in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 3 about how our rewards are going to be purged by fire, are they not? Because fire purifies. Now, what is a star? A star is nothing but fire, right? Well, it's kind of stupid to say that they're not pure. How can you get anything cleaner than fire? How could you have anything impure when the whole thing is fire? They are cold spots in the temperature of the surface of the sun. Some of those spots are big enough to put about five of the earth side by side, right down in the hole in the, in the sun. That is an imperfection. That is what science calls them. They call them an imperfection in our sun. And uh, they, they come in an 11-year cycle. And they affect our radio waves, what they tell me. But you know what's funny about that? I don't think Job ever saw those. I don't think, I don't think who wrote this book ever saw sunspots. Do you think they did? You think they got out their telescope with their binoculars and got up on Mount Palomar and, and uh, Palomar and, and looked up at the sun and said, Oh, look, the sun is a star and there's spots on it, so it's not pure, so all the other spots aren't pure. 
You know what one tells me? Hey, what happens if you look at the sun? You go blind, right? God can look right at it. He said they're not, they're not pure or what? In his sight. I mean, he looked right at the sun. You know why? I mean, the whole thing, in his glory, probably the whole thing looks like a dark spot to him. I mean, in, in the reflection of his light, the sun is probably, a, it looks like a dark spot. But the Bible says that the, sp the stars are not pure in his sight. God knew the stars were not pure. He knew that. And so the writer Job. And science didn't know it until they discovered it. Look at chapter 26. And verse 7, he says this, He stretcheth out the north over the empty place. Well, that don't make any sense. Space is empty, isn't it? I mean, how can you have an empty place in space? You know what science discovered some years ago when Disney made a movie about? I didn't go see it. I just knew they made it. I didn't go see it. You know what they, you know what they, they have up there? They have what they call an empty, empty place in space. And they call them a black hole. Oh, I know the theory is that it's the sun who's, who's collapsed in on itself and the gravity is so strong that the light can't get out. And, oh, yeah, man, if you believe that, dance to the music if you want. You'll do anything but believe a book. But you know what they found? Whether you like it or not, whether they like it or not, they found an empty place in space. Do you know where the first one was they found? North. What's your Bible say? Gee, you know, if they'd, have, if they'd have followed that book maybe a couple hundred years ago, maybe they'd have found that sooner. You know, that old, archaic, unsigned... Well, now, the, the Bible's not a science book. It's the only science book you have to change every three years. That's not bad. I have uh, the New King James Bible uh, version, and the New American Standard Version, and the NIV all say, uh, I stretch it out the north over the empty, over empty space. Over empty space. Not over the empty place. Listen, a place is a place that you can point at, right? Space is something like this. All space is empty. But an empty place in that space is something you can put your finger on. Almost like the King James Bible is a little more exact, wouldn't you say? A little more accurate than the rest of them. Look at the rest of this verse. And hangeth the earth upon nothing. Have you ever heard anything more unscientific than the earth hanging out in space on nothing? Everybody knew what the time this book was written. Everybody with half an ounce of sense, with a little bit of education, with some science behind him, everybody knew that the earth was flat. It was being held up by, a, by a, a couple of elephants, and those elephants were on the back of a large turtle, and that turtle was walking through space. Everybody knew that. You didn't know that. They didn't teach you that. Oh, don't tell me they threw out your science textbook and gave you another one. Don't tell me that your science textbook got archaic. Don't tell me that it got outdated when this one here, that's much older than your science book, never did get outdated. That doesn't make sense, does it? So you know what they did? They shot something up into space and put a camera in it and they turned it around and turned, looked back and the turtle never smiled and the elephants never roared or anything. You know what? They found out the earth was hung on nothing. But before anybody believed that the earth was hung on nothing, the writer of Job said the earth was hung on nothing. Now look, people. This Bible says some outrageous things, doesn't it? I mean, you know, the earth is hung on nothing, and there's an empty place in space, and the moon doesn't shine, and the stars are... Those things are very unscientific, aren't they? You want to know something else is unscientific? I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. I'm going to leave. You know how I'm leaving? I'm going to fly. You know what I'm going to do one of these days? My body's going to leave this earth. Now, does that sound scientific? Not on your life. Not if I'm not in a 747 or an L-1011 or a Concorde or something like that. Why, no, no man can fly, right? I mean, you get your hang glider, you know, and your little ultralight, do all that other stuff. Nobody's going to get off the ground without anything like that, right? Nope. I'm going on God power. You say, well, that sounds awful crazy. Yeah, so does the fact that you're hung on nothing sound crazy. Until it's been proven. Look at Job 37. Job 37, verse 7. He sealeth up the hand of every man. How do you do that? How is your hand sealed? Fingerprints. That's right. Do you know that every one of us has a different set of fingerprints? 
That is our seal. That is the absolute uh, identification point that my... Nobody's been able to forge them. Nobody has been able to make phony fingerprints. Look, you can get somebody that looks like somebody, that sounds like somebody, that walks and talks like somebody. You can't get somebody that's got somebody else's fingerprints. Do you realize that in that verse, God helped the, every, every uh, police department in the world? He sealed up the hand of every man that we might know his works. He wanted us to know that by looking at our thumb, you talk about people saying, well, what about the heathen that never heard? The heathen that never heard looked at their hand. Don't you realize that? The heathen that never heard had, you know what? This really happened. There was a, uh, a Russian Christian, and there was a couple, a man and his wife, staying on a corner in, a, in a downtown Moscow, and the Lord told that Russian Christian to go talk to them. And he said, Lord, if I go talk to them, you know, I'm in Russia, they'll throw me in jail for, for witnessing, and, and the Lord said, go talk to them. And so he walked over, and he, he kind of butted in, you know, and he said, um, I'd like to tell you about Jesus Christ. They said, who's that? And he said, well, he's the Son of God. They said, who's that? He said, well, um, he's the one that made us. They grabbed him and said, we have been looking for him. You know what they were? They were a couple of Russian scientists who, by looking at their hand, had come to believe that we were created because he said that thumb couldn't happen by accident. They said, that thing right there, the way it works, they looked at their hand, they looked at their fingerprints, and they looked at their thumb, and they said, none of this could happen by accident. Something or somebody made this, and they said, I wish we could find out who it was. And that fellow led them both to Christ on a, on a Moscow street corner because their hand was sealed. Look at verse 38, or chapter 38, chapter 38. Now, here's one that's absurd. Verse 7, when the morning stars sang together. Now, let's face it, stars don't sing, right? I mean, other than ones out of Hollywood. Kind of strange that they call those people out in Hollywood stars, isn't it? Do you ever wonder why they do that? I wonder if they're quoting the King James Bible when they get those people that sing and call them stars. I don't imagine they could be mimicking a King James Bible. I, I, I doubt that. Anyway, it says that the morning stars sang together when the Lord made the earth. You know what science has since discovered? I like that term. They have discovered that all stars send out radio waves. Now, they don't do it all the time. They only do it periodically. And we have huge radio antennas to pick up the uh, radio waves from stars. We'll have them pointed at a star. And when they finally start coming in, do you know what a scientist will say? The scientist, this King James Bible-believing scientist will say, the stars are singing. That is their terminology for receiving radio waves from a star, which is not pure, from a star out in space. They say the star is singing. Where do you think they got that from? They got it from the same book you and I got it from. They got it from the same book God wrote. They got it from the same book that their creator made, them, the King James Bible. Chapter 38, look at verse 16. Hast thou entered into the springs of the sea? Now, that's a crazy one. And everybody knows that the sea is salt water, right? You know what the Bible said? The Bible said that the sea has springs in it. Now, I'm not talking about bed springs. I'm talking about cold water springs. You know what science has since discovered, oh, Jacques Cousteau and the crew? They've discovered that our seas are fed at their bases by fresh water springs. Now, you reckon Job was a scuba diver? You reckon Job had gotten out on his bathyscaphe or his... Uh, you know, his calypso and going down about, you know, three or four or five miles. You think he'd gone down there and, and tasted the water at the base of the sea? Do you think he'd done that? You think the writer of Job did that? You know what I think? I think the writer of Job, when, when God said there's springs in the sea, I think the writer of Job said that's one of the craziest things I've ever heard. But I'm going to do it. I'm going to write it. If you said write it, I'm going to write it. Hasn't God ever told you to do something that sounded crazy? Man, you ain't lived. Chapter 38, verse 19. Where is the way where light dwelleth? Where is the way where light dwelleth? You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that light dwells in a way. It doesn't dwell in a place, it dwells in a way. You know what science has since discovered? I like that term. They have since discovered that the light coming out of here, light is always moving. Uh, it's 100 and what, 186,000 miles a second, seven times around the equator in one second. That's what, at the speed of light, that's what light will do. 
This light is always moving. If you walk outside at night with a flashlight in your hand and you turn that beam on and you see that beam going out into space, when you turn that beam off, you may, that flashlight off, you don't know it, but that beam is still going out into space. We are receiving light from stars that no longer exist. Because you see, light doesn't dwell in a place. Light dwells in a way. Light is always moving. Now, the New Bible say this. Uh, New King James and New International say, or New American Standard say, uh, do you know the way to the dwelling of light? And the New International says to the abode of light. See, they try to tell you that light dwells in a place. Light doesn't dwell in a place. Light dwells in a way. It is always moving. In fact, look at the rest of the verse. And as for darkness, where is the place? thereof. Now darkness is a place. You ever been in the woods at night? That's a dark place. I don't care if darkness moves or not, it don't move fast enough to get out of my way. You ever been in a dark place? You ever been where you couldn't see your hand in front of your face? I have. You have? It was a dark, it wasn't a dark way, it was a dark place. Look down to um, Chapter, 20, or chapter 38, verse 22. Hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow? Well, I did when I was a kid. I used to make angels in the snow and snowmen and snowballs. But there are treasures in the snow. And there's two things about snow that are treasures. The first one is, and I think you all know this, and that is that every snowflake is different. If you had snow out here, I don't know how, what the snow is like in Connecticut, but if you had about two feet of snow out here, do you know that every flake is different from every other flake? Isn't that an amazing thing? You know, um, when I was a kid, we used to get a car key. And we'd take that car key and we'd go to other cars from that manufacturer. You know what we'd find out? We'd find out that car key working a dozen cars. They've only got so many. Listen, uh, if you've got a car key, don't be stupid enough to think that the car key in your pocket only starts your car. Now, it probably starts 150 cars, 200 cars. Now, they're scattered all over the United States. You're not, you're not going to run into one. But the fact is that they've only got so many uh, designs on those keys. And then you look at God, and he can make snow cover the entire country for two feet deep, and every flake is different. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? You ever try to be creative? You know what you do? You run out of gas. These guys write books. You know what they do after a while? After about their fourth or fifth book, they start repeating themselves. You know why? These, these novels and stuff, you know why? Because they can't create anymore. God makes every snowflake different. That's the treasure of the snow. But there's something else to be had in snow, and that is this. Snow brings nitrogen and other elements and minerals to the soil that even rain does not bring. You can grow things where you get snow, that you cannot grow things where it gets cold and does not snow. Snow will help the soil. You know what I'm telling you? I'm telling you that snow has a treasure. Now, I understood that one second half of the verse stumped me for a while. Hast thou, hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow, or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail? Now, I, I'll be honest, I couldn't say anything good about hail. It dents cars, dents aluminum siding, tears windows off, uh, busts windows, tears roofs off, kills cro uh, or smashes crops and trees. I've never been able to really understand anything about hail that was good. Then I noticed something about verse 22, and what I noticed was that it doesn't end with a period, it ends with a comma. And I better read the rest of the, the next verse, and it says this, Or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail, which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war? You know what I realized? I realized that hail is God's artillery. When I read that, I, I thought back to... Um, I believe it's Joshua chapter 10. Do you remember when Israel went out against the enemies of Israel and God brought hail? It says more of them died from the hailstones than died from Israel, the Israel's army. Now I have some stuff here on hail. It says uh, in 1856 or 1853, there was a hailstorm in India, killed 3,000 cattle and 50 people. In 1855, there were hailstones in India that that. Um, killed dozens of people. They were one and a half pounds. Imagine a, a hailstone of a, a pound and a half. And, uh, man, must be India's getting the, just, just India's what I've got. 1888, they were hailstones the size of goose eggs and oranges, and it killed 250 people, and they, they were on the ground for two feet. Two feet deep, the size of goose eggs, killed 250 people. You know what hail is? Hail's God's artillery. 
When I thought about what happened in Joshua, then I thought about what the Bible says is going to happen in Revelation. You know what the Bible says in Revelation? It says there's going to be a hailstorm where there's going to be a talent and weight. You know what a talent is? 52 pounds. You ever seen a 50-pound block of ice? A 50-pound block of ice was, is, is about that big. It's just about, say, 10 to 12 inches square, cube. How would you like those to be dropping out of the sky right now? I'll ask you this. Where would you go if they dropped out of the sky right now? You wouldn't stay here. This place would be on top of itself in about, oh, I'd say, easily 30 seconds. You're going to go to one of these cabins? You're going to get in your car, are you? You know what? When God brings those hailstorms down, listen, they're going to strip the trees. They're going to splinter the trunks. They're going to cave in everything that this earth has ever seen, 52-pound hailstorms. You know what? In the Navy, when they, when they uh, want to fire around at a ship, that's why I like thunderstorms. I really do, but I don't like hailstorms. The sound of hail bothers me. I don't care how small it is. When they, when they see a ship, they fire one shot to the far side of it. Then they drop the next one in this side of it. That's called bracketing. That's called getting its range. Once you know where one goes to go beyond it and one this side of it, the next one, then the, the third one, you know what they say? They say fire for effect. In Vietnam, when they called in artillery, they would say, they'd, they'd say fire around and they'd fire one round. And uh, they have a battery of guns. They have nine guns or a dozen guns, and they'd, they'd fire only one round from one gun, and it'd land too far away, and they'd say, drop back, and they'd fire that, and it'd land short, and they'd say, okay, uh, raise it up about 10 degrees and fire for effect. Boy, they'd open up everything. You know what I think about when I see a hailstorm? I wonder if God's not bracketing us. I wonder if God isn't, you know, just, just firing one beyond and firing one this side just to get the range, you know, because when he lets it go, people, hey, I'll tell you, you know, that's all we need right now is a good hailstorm. I mean, it'd take care of what we got left, wouldn't it? Better respect them hailstorms. Look at uh, verse 24. By what way is the light parted? Light can be taken apart. Now, everybody knows light can't be taken apart. You can take apart one of these lights, but you can't take apart light, right? That's dip stretching it again, isn't it? Until somebody found out you can take light apart. Have you ever seen what light looks like when it's taken apart? I have. Very pretty. How do you take it apart? A prism. A little old triangular shaped piece of glass. Some of you got them crystals in your chandeliers or, or uh, something else, but a little prism. You walk over to a, a window and you hold that prism up and you know what it does? It disassembles that light. It takes it apart. It makes it seven equal parts. Red, orange, yellow, blue, uh, green, blue, indigo, and violet. It takes it apart. A prism does it. Maybe Job had one in his pocket. I don't know. Maybe he had one since he was eight years old, played with one, you know, when he was burning ants with his magnifying glass in one hand and the prism in the other, you know. And here's something all women appreciate. Biblical discovery. Look at verse 35. Canst thou send lightnings that they may go and say, here we are. Now, lightning's bad stuff. And then one day, Ben Franklin listened to his wife and went out and flew his kite. And he discovered that lightning was uh, electricity, did he not? Do you know how your telephone operates? Your telephone operates through lightning, through electricity. Have you ever gone anywhere? You know, and I, we travel all the time, and my folks have gotten away from it now. But you know what my mother would say all the time? She'd say, when you get there, call me and let, you know, let me know you're okay. So we would go halfway across this country. We would grab this little black box or cream-colored box or white box, or whatever color it was. We'd pick it up and we'd dial up this lightning and we'd send it to Ohio. And in Ohio, my mother would pick up the other end and the lightning would go through and I'd say, here we are. Haven't you ever done it? Haven't you ever gone any place and had to call back and tell somebody, here we are. Haven't you ever done it? You're going to do it when your kid goes to college. You're going to tell them when you get there, call me. And they're going to say, we're here. Look, not only did he tell you how it worked, he even told you what you're going to say on it. We're here, safe and sound. <laughs> Look at uh, Isaiah chapter 40.
Isaiah chapter 40. Verse 22, talking about God, it says, And it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. You know what Isaiah knew? Isaiah knew something none of the scientists knew. He knew the world was round. He knew the world was round. When, when science, when the scientific minds of his day said it was flat, Isaiah wrote down that it was round. And don't you think he got laughed at? I mean, anybody's going to run, run around naked for three years. Who can believe about what he says about the earth, right? He said God told him to do that. Why? Surely the guy couldn't be straight as far as the science is concerned. People, this world's round. Now, what you may not have known is, did you know that Christopher Columbus was a Christian? Now, I've heard people knock him. Listen, Christopher Columbus was born again man who had a burden for souls, and he wrote a book. And uh, one of the things that Christopher Columbus did is, you know what his favorite book of the Bible was? This is the truth. His favorite book of the Bible was the book of Isaiah. Christopher Columbus wrote a book in Portuguese, which was his native language, called the Book of Prophecy. Now, do you remember them teaching you that in public school? How many of you were taught that in public school? I don't see one hand. How many of you were told that Columbus was a Christian? How many of you were told that he came here looking for gold? Yeah, now I see hands. How many of you were told he came here and, and came here four times and went back in chains and he never knew he discovered another land? How many of you heard that? You know that that's not true? Isn't it funny that what's not true your public school told you? And what is true they didn't? It's almost like they don't want to admit the truth. The fact is this. Christopher Columbus was a born-again man. He had a burden for souls. His favorite book of the Bible was the book of Isaiah. And I'm here to tell you today that he got his idea on the wor world being round from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22. He wrote a book called the Book of Prophecy. And in that book, he said that God had called him to take the gospel to a people who had never heard it. He was going to go to a land where nobody knew and take the gospel. He came here four times, went back in chains. I'll tell you why he went back in chains. He went back in chains because he wasn't here for gold. He, why do you think they put him in chains for? Everybody that came after him was after gold, weren't they? What did the Spaniards do in, in Mexico? They were after gold. Columbus was not. He didn't fit in with the program. He didn't fit in with the social mores of the day. So they put him in chains. Said he never knew where he'd been. He knew where he'd been. And he tried to do what God told him to do. He got it out of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22, the circle of the earth. 2 Samuel chapter 22. Second Samuel chapter 22. Now, here's a very unscientific thing. Kind of crazy. Verse 16, And the channels of the sea appeared. Now, people, you ever seen the ocean? Have you ever seen the Atlantic or the Pacific? I've seen them. How could you have a channel in there? How could you have a, a river of water in a, in a piece of water that big? Well, you know what science has since found out? Science has since found out that there are ocean currents in our oceans, you know that you go down the Gulf of Mexico, you go off the coast of Florida, and you take you a bottle, and you throw it far enough out there, uh, if you throw it out one place, it'll wash back up on the shore. But if you throw it out in another place, it gets into what is called the Gulf Stream. You know where it'll end up? England. It goes from the Gulf of Mexico up across the Pargasso Sea, across the Atlantic, and ends up on the shores of England. You know why? Because it got inside a channel in the sea. If you were on a raft and you were out there in one place, you'd just drift listlessly and go nowhere. If you just got inside one of those channels, it would take you all the way across the ocean. Now, do you really think that uh, Samuel had done a back treading in the Atlantic Ocean? You think he'd been, you know, playing with his rubber ducky out in the Pacific? You think he'd been doing that? Not on your life. But you know what he did know? He just happened to know the person that made him. He just happened to know the one that started the currents flowing. And keeps them flowing. In fact, that book says, "By him, he, all things are made by him, and by him all things consist." You know why we're having a heat wave today? Because the jet stream that comes from the west right across the United States has, for some reason, that's what they say. We don't know why. I know why. Has split. And it goes to Mexico and, and Canada, and it's coming around the United States. I know who made the jet stream, so I know who split the jet stream, and I think our country better get right with the author of the jet stream. 
Look at 1 Kings chapter 5. You ever see a picture of a logger? Great big guys. Well, they don't believe in God. They're, they're not afraid of anything. You know every logger? Every logger that ever lived had to follow a King James Bible. Paul Bunyan, all of them included. Canadian, up in Washington State, it doesn't matter. They all follow a King James Bible. You know why? Look at verse 9. Look how they move their logs. My servants shall bring them down from Lebanon unto the sea, and I will convey them by sea in floats. So every logger that ever lived had to put all of his, sh all of his logs in the, in the river and connect a bunch of them around them and have floats. Every logger that ever lived had to follow and abide the rules of a King James Bible and even named what he had. He called them floats. Now you think some logger somewhere in the Canadian uh, mountains when he cut those things down and put them in the river, he says, hey, let's name this after uh, a word I read in my King James Bible. But he's going to do it. Because saying God made the logger, wrote the book. Look at Zechariah chapter 14. You know, tourism is very big in Israel, and they build hotels, motels, and restaurants just about everywhere they can. Some years ago, they were going to build one on the Mount of Olives, and they couldn't. And the reason they couldn't is found in verse 4. I'm talking about when the Lord comes back, and it says, And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. When the Lord touches the Mount of Olives, it's going to split right down the center. It's going to go east and west. It's going to have a split that goes north and south through it. And when they went and dug the, dug the testings for the foundation, put the foundation down for that hotel that they wanted to build the Mount of Olives, you know what they found out? They found out there's a, there's a fault right in the middle of the Mount of Olives. You know which way it runs? It runs north and south. You know which way that means that thing will split? That means it will split east and west. Now, isn't it amazing that some enter enterprising capitalist had to prove your King James Bible was the Word of God? Isn't it amazing that a lost man will do more to give credence to a King James Bible than many saved men will? Isn't it funny that a lost man... Listen, do you know something? If you want to come, come Christmas, if you want to hear Luke chapter 2 read out of a King James Bible, you tune in a lost radio station in this area. Because I'll guarantee you, if you tune in a Christian station, they'll read it out of an NIV or a New King James Bible. Isn't that true? Lost man knows the Word of God when he hears it. You know why they're doing that? Because they don't want, they don't, they don't want our, they want a whole generation to grow up having not heard the Word of God. One more and then we're done. Look at, uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And it says this. Verse 3, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Can you see this pulpit? Can you all see this pulpit? You can't see what this pulpit's made of. Isn't that wild? What is this pulpit made of that you can't see? Atoms. This thing is, I, I heard a guy preach one time, he's kind of weird. Uh, he'd gotten into too much materialism and... and uh, Science. He said, he got up and he preached, and he, he was serious. He said, this pulpit is not solid. Or he was preaching, he said, this pulpit is not solid because all the atoms in it are always moving. Now, my response to that is, well, then put your non-solid head through that non-solid pulpit. Right? I mean, if it ain't solid, put your hand through it, right? Here's a, here's a window pane that's certainly not solid. Go put your hand through it. No, I mean, it's solid. It's, that'll do till solid comes along, won't it? But it's made of something you can't see. And what it's made of is it is made of atoms. 
So your King James Bible told you about the Adam before Einstein or anybody else, Enrico Fermi or anybody else. Before anybody knew anything about Adams, the writer of Hebrews wrote down that everything that is made is made of things that do not appear. Now, there's two things that I want to call to your attention about an atom. Uh, the first one has to do immediately with what, what we are dealing with in our drought. You know, for years, uh, it was years of research and development and millions of dollars and trial and error. And after all those years and years and years, we came up with an atomic bomb so that we could destroy one city, Hiroshima, right? You realize that, that was a lot of trouble to go to for one bomb, wasn't it? Look what God's got to do to stop the whole country. He just shut off the water. Well, that's cost efficient, isn't it? Now, the second thing I want you to notice is this. I, now, I, I'm not, I'm not going to theorize God's going to do it, but have you ever seen what an atom looks like? An atom is like this. It's like that. See that? Well, you see the atoms? This is not solid chocolate. Chalk. This is, this is always moving, those atoms. All right. An atom looks like this, I hope, and it's got things going around it. Right? You know what your solar system looks like? Looks like that, doesn't it? With a sun in the middle. What happens when you split one of these? That's a lot of power, isn't it? Do you ever imagine what would happen if God got mad enough to... Uh... I'm not saying he's going to do anything like that. I don't have anything in the Bible that says he's going to do anything like that. All I'm saying is that if we can split an atom... I mean, look at man. We can take the smallest thing there is and break it in half. Wow, boy, isn't, that, isn't that something... What if God took our sun and broke it in half? Could you imagine how much energy could be released if what one atom being split ends up with a Hiroshima or a Nagasaki? If that can happen from us splitting one atom, did you ever wonder what it would be like if God got mad enough to split a solar system? I'll tell you what. you know what the everlasting gospel is? I'm not talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know what the everlasting gospel is? It's a gospel that was preached before Christ came, and it's one that's preached after, after during tribulation or anything else. You know what the everlasting? It's always good to tell somebody this. You know what it is? Fear God. That's the everlasting gospel. Fear God. Revelation, I believe it's chapter 14, verse 7. I'm not sure that's a quote. But in Revelation chapter 14... There's an angel that preaches the everlasting gospel and the, and the everlasting gospel is fear God. Listen, anybody that could shut off the water, you better fear. Anybody that could split a solar system, you better be afraid of. You know something else about atoms? The electrical makeup of an atom, yeah, now what is it, like? is it light charges that repel? Does everybody know? All right. The makeup of an atom is that it should be repelled. It should come apart. An atom is naturally made to come apart. It is contrary to the laws of magnetism. You know what that means? That means something has to actively... Look, look, watch. I'm going to show you something. Uh, all right. Now, I got, this, I got this date book in my hand. Now, what does the law of gravity say is going to happen if I let go of it? It's going to drop, right? The law of gravity says that's always going to happen, Right? The only way it's not going to happen if, is if someone actively prevents it from happening, right? Now, I hold it, my hand under it. I prevent the law of gravity from doing it. But the law of gravity wants to make this thing fall, right? The law of electri uh, electricity says that an atom wants to blow apart. I mean, big deal. It's wanted to do that. Science says we did it. Man, it's been wanted to do that for years, for centuries. Unless something actively keeps it together. And that's Colossians 1.17, by, by him all things were made, and all things consist. Now you look at yourself. You know what you are? You are a pile of unstable atoms. That's what you are. Listen, if one atom can make Hiroshima, what do you think is going on in the chair in front of you? What is that? Now, I, and I, think they, I know they put some of them in hamburgers because I've had a few of them go off right after I ate them, you know, some of them gut grenades. But um, 
Did you ever realize the explosive situation that we live in? Did you ever realize, have you ever heard anything said about uh, people catching fire? How many of you ever heard about people just catching fire? You ever wonder what happened? I, I've, heard, I've read reports where it said somebody caught fire and they burned and their clothes didn't burn. They just burned up. I heard somebody out on the dance floor, they burn up. I heard talk about a guy, somebody saw a fire in a car, walked over, the guy driving the car just burst in flame. If I'm not mistaken, I think in the last six months somebody caught fire over in Europe. Just poof. You know what you ought to do? Fear God. That's what you ought to do. Listen, if I, was, if I had a 45 pointed at your brain, you'd have some respect for me, wouldn't you? You'd, make, you'd say nice things to me, wouldn't you? You know, nice gun. <laughs> big gun. I like you. I like people whose names start with S and end with M or something. You know, you'd, you'd say all kinds of things to treat me good. You know what you ought to do? You ought to fear God. You're going to quote his book from now till you go home, right? All right, people, let's just remember that.